Hi, everybody. It's Paula Sturm here with Radically Nourished, and I'm here with my colleague Jolene. Again, today we're going to talk about hypothyroidism and issues with your thyroid and how to manage that. So I'm excited to jump in and talk about everything related to thyroid, or at least a lot of things related to thyroid, because this is such a big topic. There's so much to talk about uh, in regards to this. So hopefully we can at least touch the surface and get some good information out there. Guys, I want to go start. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, there is a lot to talk about with the thyroid. Um, I first sort of want to talk about maybe the main symptoms of hypothyroidism, because we do see it a lot in the clinic. It's just so prevalent. Um, some of the main symptoms would be like fatigue, um, hair thinning, depression, um, the outer third of your eyebrows thinning. Um, cold hands and feet, just cold all over all the time, even if it is like somewhat of a hot day outside. Um, and then weight gain is a huge one and an ability to lose weight too. Um, basically the thyroid is involved in the speed at which the cells function. So really it, it impacts everything. This is just like a small list um, of the main ones but it really impacts every single function in the body. Yeah, um, including fertility and constipation. I see a lot of those too. Yep, constipation is definitely one of them. Um, hair thinning, we see a lot of that. Excessive hair loss, um, just excessive sleep to function too. That's the main one. And also high cholesterol and um, like a puffy face, especially around the under eyes or around the eyes, puffiness around the eyes. That's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, what else is there? Um, also leaky gut. It does affect the gut as well. Thyroid is definitely necessary to repair the gut. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are the main ones. There's a huge list of other things to go over, but those are the main ones. Um, I also wanted to go over some lab values too. So, in our clinic, we run a really comprehensive thyroid test, which I do recommend because it's it's not okay to just run TSH because you need to know what the T4, the T3 are, the levels of it, um, and also reverse T3 and T3 uptake. And also with some people, if there are some symptoms of like autoimmunity going on, you might want, want to run some thyroid antibodies. So that would be like thyroid globulin antibody and thyroid peroxidase antibody. Those come up quite a bit in our clinic too. A lot of autoimmunity going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see a lot of people who feel like they just have hypothyroidism, but nobody's ever checked to see if it's actually related to an immune response because Sometimes we get confused and think, oh, it's my thyroid. Well, it can be, but is it your immune system's impact on your thyroid? Are we looking at it from a wrong lens? Do we have to go further and look at your immune system and how it's functioning and how that your immune system can work better and therefore your thyroid can work better? So yeah, those antibodies can be really important. And a lot of people do suffer from uh, Hashimoto or uh, Hashimoto's too, but just hypothyroidism. Um, one of the stats that I have here is nearly one in 20 Americans age 12 and older have underactive thyroid. And then even I've heard things 80 or 90% of those people might even have Hashimoto. So there's a large percentage of just those hypothyroidism uh, individuals who do have an immune component to it as well. So you need to know that because we need to be able to support somebody from an all around standpoint so they can get the best care. Yes. yes. And then going back to the other lab values like TSH. So the reason why I love functional medicine is because we look at optimal lab ranges. So if you look on the lab ranges for like a con conventional medical clinic, um, or even our clinic, we have the lab ranges on the side too, but those are really averages for the American population. So those aren't functional either. So like when it comes to TSH, the range is so broad. I believe it's like one to, what is it? Or below one to like four point something. But for us, optimal TSH, that's thyroid stimulating hormone, that, that's the hormone that stimulates your thyroid to make thyroid hormone. 
So when it's really high, you're more hypothyroid. Very low is hyperthyroid. So we like it to be between one to two. And even ranges like 2.5, 3, 3.54, you see a lot of hypothyroid symptoms with that as well. So one to two for TSH. And then I like to see T4 and T3. Like sometimes the TSH will be normal and then T4 will be on the lower end of normal. And then T3 will either be low or somewhat low, you know, low normal. And, and those, they, those T3s and T4s are really the, the hormones that are coming from your thyroid, that TSH is coming from your brain. So when we're measuring TSH, we're just measuring what your brain's telling your thyroid. Well, what information is your thyroid getting? Is it able to produce the T4 and the T3? And the T4 is the inactive hormone and the T3 is the active. And so if your T3 is low, but your T4 is normal and your TSH is normal, and you're still feeling like you have hypothyroid symptoms, that's why is because that active hormone is just not at a level. Maybe you're not doing the conversion. You're not getting that T4 into the T3, and then you're going to feel hypothyroid. So sometimes people can feel really defeated when they go to their doctor and they say, all of your labs are normal. You don't have anything thyroid related. And it's because they just are looking at a TSH, which is the common lab marker to look at. Very rarely do we have a full thyroid panel run in conventional medicine. And so we're really doing people a disservice and they're feeling really defeated. They're like, well, I can't lose weight. I'm infertile. I'm you know, losing my hair. My brain is foggy. I can't sleep. I'm freezing all the time. It really feels like I have hypothyroid symptoms and, but I'm not getting it diagnosed correctly. So yeah, those labs are really important. Do you have any more information you want to share on those? Yeah. Like that the TSH comes from your brain. So like, if it's not working properly, sometimes things suppress, um, the TSH too, like too high cortisol will suppress TSH. So if a doctor is only running TSH and it's low or within the range, that doesn't really tell you much. You always need to run T4 and T3. It could be something going on in your brain. Your brain might be a little underactive, you know? So, so that's really important. And then another thing that I see a lot is the thyroid resistance or that the receptors aren't there because either there's too much inflammation going on or there's not enough omega-3s in the diet. So we like to run the T3 uptake. The range starts from 24, but we really like to see it at 27 and above. And so whenever someone comes in and they say, I never have fish in my diet or very, very little seafood, I'm not having iodized salts, um, I'm not eating any like seaweed or sea vegetables, stuff like that, their T3 uptake always comes up as low because it's the omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory. So that helps with the CRP, which is the inflammatory marker to come down. And also it helps with the cell membrane. The omega-3s are very important because they help with the fluidity of the membrane. So it helps with the receptors to go in and out. If the cell membrane is really just not fluid, the receptors can't work properly. So the T3 uptake is super important. Like I've seen lots of people with um, like even a high T3 I've seen and a high T4, but their T3 uptake is low. So they're not getting the thyroid into the cell um, and they're still exhibiting symptoms of hypothyroid. So the T3 uptake is super, super important. And so in order to increase that, you need to look for the inflammatory sources in your diet, your life, and also really get the fish in at least three times a week. If you're worried about the mercury, I would suggest to really go for the low mercury fish and also get some selenium in the diet too, to get the mercury out, but three times a week for fish. And then also a couple of grams two to four grams of an omega-3 is going to help to replete the omega-3s in the body. That's if like you really avoided seafood or, or fish for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about the reverse T3 as well? Cause that one's super interesting too. Yes. Have you, have you seen much with that one? Every so often, not a lot, but it's generally in those people that have really resistant weight loss and really super fatigued and nothing's working for them. And they're uber stressed. 
super, super stressed. And yeah, so their T3 is just getting inactivated, inactivated, inactivated. And so now they're feeling like they're hypothyroid because their T3 isn't even active. It's reversed. It's not doing its job. It's totally inactivated and stress, inflammation, uh, anything that creates stress in your body, like uh, gut pathogens or food sensitivities, gluten, all of those types of things that are creating an internal stress. And then if there's a lot of stress going outside in your life, then that too can have a really big impact on how your body manages that T3. So there's a lot of different reasons why somebody can feel hypothyroid and their TSH can be totally normal. Right. Yes. I actually do see that quite a bit, the reverse T3 being elevated. And the reason why it gives you hypothyroid symptoms is because it's sort of like the thyroid hormone. It still binds to the thyroid receptor, but it's inactive. So it basically blocks the real thyroid hormone from working properly. So you get hypothyroid symptoms. Um, and so, right, like you said, the stress really elevates that reverse T3. Um, inflammation is another one, infections, toxins, a couple other things too, but those are really, really the main ones. Oh, low calorie dieting as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. That goes into the whole fasting. And when somebody has, uh, any, any thyroid symptoms or thyroid issues, I never tell somebody they should be fasting. No, no intermittent fasting for you. We need to make sure we're eating balanced meals and no super uber duper low carb keto diets. They need some carbs in their diet, just very balanced, very boring, but that's what works. Right, right. Yeah. Whenever someone's like over exercising, low calorie dieting, the thyroid down regulates because it's a protective mechanism to not, you know, shrivel up and, and die, you know, so it, it elevates and slows down the metabolism so that you don't waste away you know? So it is very important to eat consistently throughout the day, the blood sugar. Yeah. Um, See our first episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So those are like really the key markers that we look for the TSH, T4, T3, free T4, free T3, um, T3 uptake, reverse T3, and then the thyroid antibodies too. Yeah. Those are key. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to go into Hashimoto's a little bit. I know you deal with a lot of people with Hashimoto's and I feel like it's like an epidemic nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, but did you have something to say about the Hashimoto's? I know you deal with a lot of people. That have yeah, yeah, I do. I want to say one more thing about the labs too, uh, especially if you're on medication and you're just getting your labs tested once a year. Like that just isn't enough because um, your thyroid levels can change and your labs can change pretty rapidly and significantly. And if you're not catching it at certain times, because you're like, you're, like I said, it, it changes rather rapidly. So you could go in, get your lab test on that one day, every 365 days, and it could be normal, but then six hours later, a week later, all of a sudden it's super low or it's super high. And that's where people are like, well, I'm taking medication, but I'm not feeling any better, or I still have everything. Or all of a sudden they go super hyper. And if somebody's newly diagnosed, your labs are going to be all over the place, especially in the beginning. And it's going to be really hard to get them regulated. So you have to know what's happening so you can properly manage that medication. And it's not to say medication is bad to be on thyroid medication. It's just that we want to try to get your body to a point where it's not constantly increasing every year. Can we get some stability in that medication? So you're getting your labs run maybe a few times a year, monitoring where it is, you know, adjusting your medication appropriately. But if we can get your, especially like leading into this Hashimoto's com conversation, when you're uh, talking about um, managing your medication and getting that immune component, which is what Hashimoto's is, is something going on with your immune system. It's an autoimmune condition. So it's not necessarily a thyroid condition, but sometimes you need to be on medication in order to keep those symptoms at bay. And so getting your immune system properly balanced out can really help with those lab levels level, uh, staying more level and equalizing. So you're not constantly raising your medication every time you go to the doctor. So that's where it can be really important to know, do you actually have an autoimmune immune thyroid condition and not just a 
hypothyroid condition. So understanding those antibodies is really critical because if we can understand if it is an immune thing, we need to work on that. That's the key area that we need to focus on. What's upregulating your immune system right now? Do you have a vi some viruses that are underlying? Is there some gut pathogens? Is there some stress or some other things uh, gluten, all these other things that have come into the picture here that are throwing your immune system off. And it happened to be that your thyroid was the weak link and bang, that's where your immune system decided to, to attack. And then you're, you're into that autoimmune or that self attack or that your immune system attacking itself at that point. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of tie that in and how important it is to get those regular labs done more than just once a year. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it, it brings me back to, you know, with the Hashimoto's patients, yes, you want to address that before you start giving them more medication. And also just in general too, like with any type of um, hormone that you give, you can always produce a receptor resistance, just like with insulin and diabetes, like you just have to give more and more and more. And we're not really looking to, to fix the, the receptor function, the receptor resistance. So same thing like with the thyroid, if you're given too much thyroid hormone too, and the receptors are downregulating, you're gonna have to give more and more and more to get the same effect. So yeah, same thing with Hashimoto's, if it's an immune condition, you have to fix that first. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, there's so many things that are involved, but number one, when, when someone comes in with Hashimoto's, they have to take out gluten and dairy. Um, it's a little technical, but the gluten in the dairy, the proteins in there, they cross react with some of the enzymes in the thyroid. And so if, if your immune system is already upregulated, it's a little overreactive and overzealous. So the gluten proteins, the dairy proteins, they're similar to certain proteins in the thyroid. So it'll say, hey, this one protein is a foreign protein. And since it's similar to your thyroid, to other cells in the body too, it will attack those. So number one, we have to take out gluten and dairy. And I wanna touch a little bit about that too, because some, some people, they come back and they're like, oh, I just had like a little piece of bread or a little something like every two weeks or so. But when we retest their thyroid antibodies, like two months, three months down the road, the antibodies do not reverse. If anything, they, they increase. Um, so the people that are very strict, very, very serious about getting these antibodies down, they don't even have a crumb of gluten. They try not to even go out to eat because there's a lot of cross-contamination with gluten too. Never know what you're getting in food. So those, those individuals that are really strict, their antibodies do come down almost always but they come down very, very slightly. So like in a two to three month period, I would say it comes down maybe like 20, 30 points, but you have to be persistent about it. And so it's not only the, the gluten and the dairy that affect the antibodies, but there's so many other things. Number, another one is vitamin D. So mm -hmm. vitamin, um, so like you said, Hashimoto's is an overactive immune system. So there's certain parts of the immune system, a lot of different parts. But what we like to treat with, with any autoimmunity is working on the T regulatory cells. Those are the immune cells that regulate the immune system. So if it's too overactive, it helps to bring it down a little bit. If it's too underactive, it helps to bring it up. So it really helps to regulate it. So, so there's uh, some things that you like to use to help with that. Yeah, that T regular regulatory area. I always think of it as the the fulcrum of the teeter totter with TH1 and TH2, and they're kind of going up and down instead of trying to, you know, work on these ends of the the teeter totter. It's like let's work on those that you know those regulatory cells that are keeping people or keeping these two sides balanced. Are there some favorite things that you like to use to to do that? Oh yes, there's a couple of key ones. Um, the vitamin D is very important. Really all the fat soluble vitamins, which are D, E, A, and K, but the vitamin D, very, very important. So with autoimmunity, we want it really 80 to 100. Minimum is 60 though. But once it gets to that 80 to 100 range, the immune system is a lot better regulated at that range. So that's really up there. Um, 
Also, there's other things that we give. We give um, turmeric. Turmeric is great for stimulating those T regulatory cells and bringing down the inflammation too that's going on in your thyroid because there's a lot of inflammation and oxidation going on in the thyroid. Your body is attacking those cells. So we have to give a lot of anti-inflammatory things. Another anti-inflammatory one is um, resveratrol. So we do that too. We, we like to use the Apex products as well because they are emulsified, way better absorbed in the body. And we see a lot of um, low fat digestion too. So those products are key for those people. And then another key one is glutathione. Glutathione is your master antioxidant and anti-inflammatory, and it really helps to stimulate those T regulatory cells. Mm -hmm. So those ones are key. Oh, also omega-3s. Yep. Inflammatory, and they help to stimulate the T regulatory cells. And another, another one, another two, probiotics and the fatty acids that probiotics make. The key one is butyrate. Butyrate is a short chain fatty acid produced by the good bacteria in your gut when they eat, consume fiber. So butyrate is also another really good one too. Mm -hmm. And decreasing cortisol helps with the T regulatory cells too. Yep. So working on that stress management. Yeah. Yeah. You, that's the, my same bucket that you have there are my favorite things to use in that case too. And then of course, diet too comes into play here too, because inflammation is a really key piece to regulating, re regulating your immune system. So if your inflammatory status is elevated and all those supplements are really great at controlling inflammation and then, but what are you doing with your food? Are you eating a lot of seed oils? Are you eating things that are creating reactivity like gluten and dairy or other food sensitivities, or are you not eating enough vegetables? Are you overeating? Are you not chewing your food? Well, are you eating under stress and are you eating while you're multitasking? Are you skipping meals? Meals. Like all of those things that you're doing from a nutrition standpoint can either create inflammation or create anti-inflammation. And we really want to do a lot of anti-inflammatory diet things. And it's not just what you're eating, it's how you eat it too. So there's a lot that can come into play diet wise too. We cannot forget about that. Yeah, that's a super key point. Uh, I see a lot of people eating well, on our, on our diet plan, we like to keep out the seed oils, all of them. We do allow some nuts and seeds, but some patients go over on their nuts and seeds. And I really have to emphasize like even a, like a handful of nuts has about probably around like six to nine grams of omega-6 fatty acids. That's a lot of omega-6 fatty acids. And really those are pro-inflammatory oils. You want your omega-3 fatty acids, those are anti-inflammatory oils. And you want the ratio really to be one to one. The standard American diet, I believe is about um, one to 15. Yeah, 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 or 20 to one. Right, and even more sometimes. So we're really just in a pro-inflamed state. So anything can really just switch that flip and turn you into like an inflammatory person, you know? So. I really like to emphasize the fish, but even doing the fish, like a thing of fish has probably like three grams of omega-3s. So you have to really try to get your omega-3s from somewhere, either from fish, seafood, supplementing is very important and sort of eliminating your, uh, limiting your nuts and seeds. And especially like it's in everything nowadays. It's in all of like the salad dressings, it's in like chicken nuggets, it's in really everything. That's the thing about it. There's not a lot of places you can get omega-3s. It's fish, it's walnuts, and it's chia seeds and flax seeds. And you know, the plant sources of omega-3s, your body has to convert those into the active form of those omega-3s. And some bodies aren't that great at doing that. So it's really, it's hard to get those omega-3s, but omega-6s, those are everywhere. Fast food, packaged food. When you eat at a restaurant, canola oil, soy oil, corn oil, all those cheaper oils are in so many foods again, cause they're cheap. And so we're getting them everywhere. And then we're not getting, and we're not eating enough of those omega-3s to 
compensate for that. So we are just in a hyper-inflammatory state. I know when I do, uh, I do omega-3 testing and I, I don't think I've seen anybody unless I've already corrected it through supplementation and diet where anybody's omega-3 status or their ratio between omega-3 and omega-6 is on point. Nobody right. coming to me uh, right out of the blue here is in a good state with their omega-3s. I haven't seen one. Yep. I see the same thing. Mm -hmm. So that's, yep. yeah, key. <laughs> very, very key. Go into diet too. Um, I want to talk about iodine as well, because that's very key for the thyroid. Sort of want to touch into some of the things that help with the conversions um, in the thyroid. So in order to make the thyroid, you need a couple of things. You need iron, which is very important. I see a lot of patients, they are low in their iron, not, not necessarily blood iron, but their ferritin is low. And I can go into that too, but you want, you want an optimal iron level. Very, very important. Um, zinc and selenium, iodine, tyrosine, vitamin E, some of the B vitamins, C and vitamin C and D help to make the T4. And then for the T4 to the T3 conversion, you need the selenium and the zinc. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of iodine deficiency nowadays. I, I, you know, I was looking at my salt for some reason one day and I was like, this, this should have iodine because it's sea salt, you know? I have Celtic sea salt and Redmond's real salt. And at the bottom in very, very th thin lettering is does not supply iodine a necessary nutrient. I was like, what the heck? I have been eating this thinking that I'm getting iodine and I'm not. And I was doing a lot of research and most salts don't have iodine. The only real iodine that we can get nowadays is the Morton iodized table salt. So, and that's devoid of minerals too, which isn't good, but um, it's just crazy. Everyone that I'm asking is doing the pink Himalayan or the Celtic sea salt. Mm -hmm. And so I always have to tell them you have to do an iodized salt. You have to get that in there. And I think that thyroid issues are really going to explode in the future because no one's doing an iodized salt at least that you know? and any radiation exposure too can lower that as well right definitely yep and so um and the reason why i feel like the iodine requirement has gone up in the past decade or so is because we've changed so many things in the environment we used to iodinate bread we used to get our iodine also from bread but now they brominate bread so there's iodine falls into the halide group on the periodic table. So they all really work on the same receptor. So if you give one, you can displace another halide. And so if we're giving something called bromide or bromine, which is another halide or fluoride, fluorine, you can displace iodine. And so bromide is in like everything nowadays. It's, it's used as a fire retardant. So it's like in our furniture, our couches, our bed, car seat, it's just everywhere. They also brominate um, like sports drinks, they brominate sodas, they brominate our bread. So they brominate um, jacuzzis, <laughs> was, oh, and pesticides too. Same with fluoride. It's just absolutely insane that they use fluoride as a pesticide nowadays. Yeah. It's like mind boggling to me. Yeah. They and it's in our water and it's, and right. those things evaporate too. So it's like when you're in the shower, it absorbs into your skin. It's evaporating in the steam and you're breathing that in. And yeah, so you're breathing it in, you're absorbing it, you're drinking it. And all of those things too are antimicrobial, which is probably why they're in pesticides. And so when you're drinking it, it's having a negative impact on your microbiome, which your microbiome is like the key to everything upstream, you know, the health of your body from many different standpoints. So if your microbiome has gone haywire, forget about having a healthy thyroid, you know, you need to have a healthy mi uh, microbiome. So it's from many different levels, these halides can have a negative impact. Right. And even chlorine, like most people don't know that the sucralose sweetener has a chlorine. I, I believe it's actually a couple of chlorine molecules attached to it, which is why a lot of people get GI distress whenever they take those, the sucralose especially. Um, but yeah, it essentially kills off the bacteria in your GI tract, and then you can get bloating and all these GI symptoms. Yeah. But going back to the fluorine, 
it's it's also found in girls makeup it's just everywhere it's crazy so and that's getting in your skin and your skin just absorbs everything so we're just inundated with halides so this is displacing the iodine in our body so that's why i feel like we need the, the rda requirement has to increase or else we're going to see like a lot of thyroid disorders in the future we're already seeing a lot mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the people i see in my practice have thyroid issues in one way or another right um and also anesthesia as well they use that oh and another big one is um medications so like Prestor, Lipitor, all the Cipro um, antibiotics, a lot. There's a huge list that have um, a fluorine molecule in the medication. Um, Pro, Prozac, yeah, all those. So you have to be careful because little things add up, you know, and then thyroid issues develop after that. Um, Even I, uh, nonstick pans too, right? Is that... Teflon pans. Yes. That's a huge place to get it. Yes. Yeah. I think that there's a documentary on that actually, um, where DuPont got sued, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, it was a long time ago that I watched the documentary, but it's crazy. Fluoride is, is very detrimental to the body. It's classified as a neurotoxin. So even a little bit is toxic. Mm -hmm. Why I don't know why they put it in our water. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I also wanted to go back to the iodine because I'm really passionate about it because iodine really changed my life. Um, I had ADHD and all that stuff in the past and iodine, I, I tried everything for it. I took tyrosine, I took uh, DLPA, I took all the precursors to it too, lots of fish oils, everything that you can think of to really help with my dopamine production. And there's a couple other things like iron deficiency, vitamin D, but it was the iodine that just really helped me the most, just turned on my brain. You know, when I, there's a simple test that you can do. It's not a diagnostic test, but you can get like povidone iodine that you can get at like Walgreens or CVS. And you can put a little drop on your forearm and make a little square and let it dry for a little bit, keep it on there. It should stay the same color for at least 12 hours. Optimal is 24. But if that that amber color goes away in like five minutes to a couple hours, it may mean that you're deficient in iodine and more testing is warranted. But when I first did it, um, this is very rare, but it went away in about five minutes. And then I did it again, like 10 minutes later, and it went away in five minutes. And I was like, I don't believe this test. <laughs> and then I did it. I started to take iodine too. And I noticed such great improvement. And then years later, when I did the test again, it stayed on there for about like five hours. And then now it stays on for at least 12 hours and sometimes 24 hours. But I take a lot of iodine in a day. And I don't recommend to take iodine unless you've had testing done. I recently had mine done and it was still about 70, 70 ish percent excretion rate, which you want about 90 to 95 percent excretion rate for iodine. So there's a, a test to, that you can do for that. And you have to do a urine test, right? Right. A 24 hour urinary test where you take 50 milligrams of iodine in the morning and then you collect your urine for the whole day until the next day in the morning. And then you they see how much iodine you excreted. Um, and I also did my bromine levels and my fluoride level too. And my fluoride was elevated, even though I drink filtered water. I think I'm getting it from maybe tea. Tea has a lot of fluoride too. Um, but yeah, there's some, fluoride is just everywhere. You know, they have to be careful. But yes, I, I've been taking about 12.5 milligrams for the past couple of years. I really started even before that, but I had such a huge detox from iodine. It really took me like a year and a half to detox from iodine. Like I would take, the first couple of times I took iodine, I had the worst reaction ever. Like I was incapacitated. I had the worst headache. Um, 
most people do not get those symptoms. I just probably was super deficient in iodine, but it took me about a year and a half to really feel better after taking iodine. And then once I could take about six milligrams of iodine every day, I started to increase a little bit. And that's and I, milligrams, not micrograms. Right. Milligrams. Yes. And really I can take a lot. Like the day that I took the 50 milligrams of iodine, I was like cleaning the house. I had so much mood. It was just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. But again, to emphasize, like in any of our recommendations here, these are our personal recommendations or things that we have used for our patients, but we don't know you. So you need to talk to your doctor or practitioner and get the recommendations specifically for you. Uh, so yeah, these are all just antidotes, education. So you really have to know what your, your body needs, what, what supplements does your body actually needs. But these are some things that you can look into or have a conversation with your practitioner about, but uh, yeah, let's just kind of run down a couple highlights. Like what are some things that people should do? So there's certain lifestyle things. If you have a, if you have an, a thyroid issue right now, you definitely want to make sure that you're removing the toxins, the nonstick pans, watch your plastic exposure, you know, get the food storage plastic containers and the water bottles of plastic. So it's the plastics have an impact on your thyroid too. Those are great things that you can do. Get a water filter on your shower, make sure that your water filter that you have at home is filtering out fluoride. Same with your shower filter, those things I recommend and those things you can do. Uh, and then food, making sure that you're getting tons of anti-inflammatory vegetables, fruit, make half of your plate full of veggies and fruit, get some carbs, get some protein, making sure you're having balanced plates, breakfast, lunch, dinner, some snacks, don't intermittent fast, you know, make sure that you're fueling your body, getting your sleep, watching your stress. Like those are things that you can absolutely do. And then to get to the nitty gritty of what's your gut doing, getting some testing done with, you know, looking at your iodine levels, looking at your gut, uh, gut test to see what your microbiome is doing, getting some further blood work, and then working with a practice or really fine tune those supplements. That's where you can sort of start and where you can go. What other recommendations do you have? Um, just a really good multivitamin, something with a selenium that's selen selenium methionine or selenium cysteine, um, and then protein too. So yeah. the thyroid is a tyrosine based amino acid. So that comes from protein. So I have seen patients where their, their phosphorus or their protein was low on their labs and their thyroid was suffering as well. So just making sure that you're getting in protein three times a day, at least. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, we had a good conversation about thyroid. I mean, this was literally just skimming the surface, but I think it was a lot of good information, but uh, yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this. Leave us a comment or let us know what you think and reach out reach out to us anytime. Uh, again, my uh, website is radicallynourished.com. Uh, my name is Paula Sturm. I'm a registered dietitian. You can also find me on Instagram at radically nourished. So where else can people find you, Jolene? Um, Instagram, it's dr.jolenyunin.nmd. Um, or you can reach out to my email to drtrier at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, until next time, when we have some more fun conversations, we will see you then. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.